Hello everyone. My name is Aisha Abdallah. I'm a director of the ALN Academy, which is a charity promoting the rule of law in Africa. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Luis Franceschi, one of our independent board members, who today will be discussing with me crisis in democracy. Welcome very much, Professor. Uh, Professor is an Assistant Secretary General at the Commonwealth based in London, but in his many previous lives, uh, one of them was that he was the Dean of our law school at Strathmore University in Kenya. Professor, um, I wanted to ask you about the number of elections that we are facing in the world in 2024. Apparently 49% of the global population will have um, elections in their countries, something like I think 64 countries uh, plus the European Union. So the sheer number of elections, is that a good thing? Does it show us that we have a very vibrant democracy or is it a challenge? Well, thank you very much, uh, Aisha. It's a fantastic thing to have so many. so many elections in the world at this time because it proves we have more democracies than dictatorships. Uh, we have more freedoms than repression. And citizens can express their will through the ballot. However, it's very true that COVID placed such a strain on freedoms and democracy that we have ended up with a regression. It's worrying, it's a trend we should make sure it doesn't get out of hand. We have to go back to the pre-COVID uh, times and perhaps even a little bit further than pre-COVID. But perhaps COVID was the, the, the last drop in that uh, gap of exhaustion. People who are exhausted um, of not having perhaps the possibility of expressing their will in a constructive manner because you are voting term after term and nothing seems to be moving. So usually this happens. I mean, it's, it's a generational issue. And if we manage to pass that generational strain that perhaps is between 40 and 50 years, okay, a new generation has replaces itself and has the opportunity of keeping democracy going. But again, we have not tested most democracies in that sense. The Second World War, the end of the Second World War was perhaps the beginning of a, a new leaf of life for, the, for, for most of the countries, especially in the West, and this was replicated throughout the world. Uh, well, this is 70, 80 years ago, so we still need more time. And we have to do the best to try to keep the momentum of freedoms and, and, and openness somehow. It's worrying that in Africa we have had six coup d'etats in the last two and a half or three years, perhaps seven coup d'etats. Seven, I think, yeah. Seven. And, and of course, it's a, a kind of, it, it, it's also a, it's kind of the political COVID, you could say, countries could suffer from because it's infectious and um, perhaps, well, in many countries you may have every general thinking that it's not such a bad idea because there seem to be no consequences. There are huge consequences for these countries, for their trade, for their people, for their freedoms, but we, we have to see this in clearer ways. Yes. Um, this year, how many elections will take place in the Commonwealth? Well, you see, it's very interesting. We, we, we just finished February, and we have already had two. two. And there were two major elections, because we had Bangladesh and mm. Pakistan in two very important countries for the Commonwealth due to their population, to their uh, location. I mean, Asia is hugely important. I mean, if you look at India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, this is practically 65% of the population of the Commonwealth. Um, we are 
supposed to have been certainly quite a number, nine elections. This year. Yeah, in what is left of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are very delicate and, and in, in very important. All of them, I mean, all countries are important. But you know, when you have elections in countries that make an impact not only internally but externally, that means, well, we I have think India is having India an election. India is having elections, yes. South Africa. South is Africa, elections. yes, we know. And of course, there are little countries, little in terms of population, but huge influence in the Pacific that are having elections. If you look at Solomon Islands and Kiribati, mm -hmm. they're having elections, they have challenges. And when you think of Kiribati, you say, well, but it's just a little island. Yes, but the mass uh, land of Kiribati, counting the maritime boundaries, mm. Um, is is almost the size of the U.S. Really, that's and, a tiny and island. There is, and that exactly, but oh. is there are several islands spread all over. Okay. And that makes it a very powerful country. All the tuna in the world passes through Kiribati. Oh. So oh, and, and precisely now with deep sea mining, that is a technique that is very much in question due to the consequences, environmental consequences it can have. Uh, well, it's becoming a, a very critical issue for some of these countries because there is a huge, there are huge minerals Mineral deposits, and, resources, and that yes. is there. So, well, certainly when when these countries become so important from the geopolitical or economic point of view, and they are very vulnerable mm. because if you look at Kiribati, the highest point on the land is three meters. So very so, low. And is uh, if you go to do, to the capital, uh, you realize that it's a one street town of 50,000 people from beginning to end because it's a very narrow island. Fantastic, beautiful place. I mean, it's paradise on earth. And people are so fantastic. But certainly, it's one street. Google Maps will never tell you turn right or turn left. It's Just you, go forward. You pass the house or <laughs> you, you go need back. It. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but anyway, this it's very interesting, a very interesting times. And uh, what is the role of the Commonwealth in these uh, elections? What, what role do you play? Well, it's huge. Uh, to explain a little bit how we work or how we do it, mm. um, as the Assistant Secretary General of the Commonwealth, I am in charge of political affairs, democracy, elections, governance, peace, rule of law, judicial transformation, human rights, countering violence so and extremism. So everything is you? Almost. I mean, everything exciting, for, especially for a lawyer <laughs> okay. and a politician yeah. uh, in the 56 countries. Mm -hmm. um, our budget is very limited, but countries expect so much from us. You know, it's very interesting. I usually say the Commonwealth is the best kept secret in London because very few people know what it is. Uh, we associate it a lot with the British Commonwealth yes. that used to be the empire. Mm. And then they think you are working with the king or you are greeting the queen every day, which is not the case at all. Certainly, um, the Commonwealth was born in a beautiful way out of the somehow dismembering or the collapse of the British Empire. Um, but it's a multilateral institution, it's a club of nations, it's friendship with a purpose. So, and it happened in a very natural way. I can explain in, 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 in one minute or two how it happened. Okay. Uh, you see, when, when India decided to go for independence or pushed for independence, the UK government had to study a way of keeping links with India because India was too important. In terms of trade? In terms of trade, okay. geopolitical, education, etc. And not only that, but India has built the UK in many ways. Even today, out of the 488 1,663 visas that the UK grants to students to go and do masters mm -hmm. or studies in the UK, 
133,756 are and Indians. Sorry, I have to ask you, why do you know these figures? Is because it also I, part of your job? I am asked. <laughs> I am asked sometimes okay. for interviews such as, like, <laughs> such as this one. But, you know, uh, well, I mean, this is an incredible percentage yeah. are people from India. And all of them are paying foreign fees. So they so are subsidizing the UK they students. They are subsidizing the, the UK students. If India stops sending students to the UK, it collapses. But then, okay. what happened in 1949? India decided to become a republic. Mm -hmm. And there was huge panic in, in the UK government because, well, can republics be part of the Commonwealth? The Commonwealth used to be the foreign realms outside the UK that were part of the empire, like Canada, Australia, okay, Australia, Australia yes. But here you have a half of the Commonwealth wanting to be a republic. So they said yes. Okay. And in that, the Queen, later Queen Elizabeth, had an incredible vision because Several countries got independence, they mm -hmm. became republics, and they could remain as part of the Commonwealth, the modern Commonwealth. So okay. it was a shift. But the Commonwealth remained being part of the Foreign Office, that is still called Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. Oh, okay. And in, 19, in the 60s, when African countries started getting independence, and they would join the Commonwealth, if they had been colonies of the UK, three incredible statesmen, men, and, and presidents uh, from Africa went to the UK at who, different who times those, sorry? to say they mm -hmm. wanted to leave the Commonwealth. They were Kwame Nkrumah, mm -hmm. Julius Nyerere, okay. and Kenneth Kaunda. Okay. So from Ghana, from Tanzania, and Zambia. Zambia. And they said, we want to leave the Commonwealth. Oh my God, why? Because we did not get independence to be part of the Foreign Office. Okay. And there was huge panic, and the government was trying to look for a solution, which Queen Elizabeth gave. Said, I give Marlborough House, which is one of my palaces, where my grandfather lived, and, 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 and my family lived, mm -hmm. and to the Commonwealth at their headquarters, so that they can get out of the foreign, foreign office. office and be an inde independent intergovernmental organization. And that's how the Commonwealth settled in Marlborough House. And all the former British colonies, as they got independence, were given a choice to join or not to join. Most did, some didn't. But the fact is that it became a club of countries that decided to stick together because they had a painful or less painful or productive colonial past. However, with time, this also changed. And instead of being a club of former UK colonies, mm. it became a club of countries united by common values. One so like being rule democracy. of law. Mm. Democracy, rule of law, yes. freedom, etc. And with the joining of Rwanda, Mozambique, Togo, Gabon, this became very clear. This is no longer because a Because these are of not colonies. British colonies. Exactly. Yes. They were never British colonies. These are countries that have decided to join because they see value in the Commonwealth. And there's a long list of countries that are approaching us, developed and okay. developing north okay. and south, mm. because they want to join the Commonwealth. They see value, which is a beautiful thing. Which how how do you demonstrate that value? I mean, uh, okay, so focusing on peace and democracy, yeah. I think there are many Commonwealth countries that are in trouble. Yeah. So where is this value in the Well, you see, in the last eight years, uh, the Commonwealth has saved, the Secretary General, through her good offices, has saved more than 16 countries from imploding. I mean, countries where the situation was horrible, polarized, there was going to be a civil war, huge unrest, or huge, and the Secretary General's intervention was key as a mediator. In the last two years, we have had six very clear examples. I mean, countries that were going through incredible dramas. I. I can mention 
because it is in the public domain, for example, Zambia, uh, where there was huge polarization. And the leader of the opposition was in jail, had been jailed 16 times. And there was huge, somehow, animosity between the leaders. And well, that leader of opposition not only was freed, but eventually, after an election which he won with huge majority, became the president of the country. So in a conversation which I witnessed uh, between Boris Johnson and, and Hakain de Hichilema, which I can mention because Hakain de Hichilema always mentions this mm. when he speaks to us, Boris was trying to convince Hakain de that Patricia Scotland was not a good SG. It's not good for you. Uh, for whatever reasons. I mean, there were disagreements between Patricia Scotland and Boris, and they had been historically in different parties. What any leaders, I mean, there's always disagreement between leaders, and thank God you are free to express whatever you think. And Hakain, they said, you know, when I was in jail, this woman came to see me in jail, and she negotiated my freedom, my release. Yeah. My release. Mm -hmm. I came out of jail thanks to Patricia Scotland, and today I'm president thanks to this woman. So I think she's good for me. <laughs> Where were you when I was in jail? You never came to see me. <laughs> and of course, they were laughing. But you say, well, hey, this is the beauty of the Commonwealth. That is not the UK. It's not India. It's not Canada. It's not Kenya. It's not Nigeria. It's the community of countries coming together and putting pressure on a leader to say, come on, you can do better. Let's so, reach an agreement. So a lot of maybe what you're talking about is maybe soft power, what we would call exactly. soft power. soft power. But you do have an important role, I think, as election observers. You play yes. a role during elections. Very true. We play a huge role. I mean, it's one of the core mandates we have been given. You know, but it's interesting. It's also soft power. Okay. Um, you know, the Commonwealth is not a treaty organization is really friendship with a purpose. It's countries that came together because of their past or because of the ideals. And, and that makes it an, interest, an organization based on soft power. So we cannot go to a country and say, uh, like in Kenya, we could not say, uh, Raila won the elections or Ruto won the elections. So simply so by being a member of the Commonwealth, you're not allowed to intervene, or you are not allowed to well, insist on participating. Exactly. So for us to observe an election, first the country, the Electoral Commission, has to invite us. But why would they invite you if they're going to fix the election? Well, you know, it's interesting. There is a, a very delicate balance there between legitimacy and results. OK. So you want the international community somehow to be aware that the elections were run and were run well and that the results are legitimate. Mm -hmm. Even if you are playing with results and even for the commission, you see, keep in mind that corruption doesn't happen always in the boardroom. I mean, in a, an election is a very complex process and you can have corruption at all possible levels. We witnessed this and the government itself said it, the Electoral Commission said it, in Nigeria, where you had 94 million registered voters, and the president wins, I mean, and the results account for less than 15 million, or 20 million at most. And you say, well, where are the other 70 million votes? Mm. So of course, I mean, the election uh, uh, had real challenges, and those challenges were, not, were in most cases were not at the top were at all possible levels. Um, so we have to be invited by the Electoral Commission. And the observers are prominent people. Um, many of them have been chief electoral officers, uh, ministers, presidents, even presidents. The chair is usually a former head of government or head of state. And this gives huge importance to the observation. Nowadays, we are also going digital, meaning we have to send among the observers people who are expert in 
technical, in like technical IT. aspects, okay. IT aspects. Why? Because before we used to observe with the eyes, everything yes. was analog. Yeah. Now there are transmission of results, mm. algorithms, so etc. So you, you, you are observing all the stages, exactly. is it? Exactly. So yeah. do you get involved if the if you're requested to, is, the, is it as early as, you know, how early is it? Is it the ballot stage, the nomination stage? Because there are controversies in Kenya exactly. at all stages yeah. of the process. Okay, that, that's one of the limits we have due to budgetary constraints. So for, the, for example, the European Union send observers who are long-term observers. They may spend six months or a year in the country. Before the election. Before the election, okay. they see everything, they understand the whole thing, etc., right. etc. Mm -hmm. But they are technical people. people. And this places a problem is what's the balance between having technical people or having highly reputable observers who can carry the weight to really observe and, and, and encourage the country to run an election well? So of course you cannot have these highly reputable people who they are usually very busy. For, yes, for they cannot so be in a country no. for, and also the expenses. I mean our but election. But how approach. how is your um, so so your the team you send? How is it funded? Exactly, the, it's funded by us. You see, countries contribute to the Commonwealth, and out of those contributions, we set up you allocate allocate okay. a fund. So we don't accept usually that the country would come and say, "I'm paying for this election." because that could be misunderstood. I mean, suppose that Kenya says, well, I am paying for you to observe the elections in Uganda. Yes. It will never be accepted <laughs> by us or yes. by Uganda. Yes. And Kenya wouldn't do it. Yes. But countries may say, I give to the election kitty, and oh, so you decide. Also, there's a specific kitty for supporting this a, a those. budget, yeah, okay. budget line that so, for elections. But that, I guess one of the issues we have with um, peace and democracy is this idea that the financing of campaigns and the financing of the process lends itself to mm -hmm. interference. Yes. Um, so I think this is one exactly. of the challenges we're facing yeah. in Africa because if we want more candidates, if we want credible candidates, mm. how will they finance their campaign? Yeah. Well, that's precisely the, the complexity of mm. democracy. You know, uh, we cannot have and we shouldn't allow us to be influenced by the Twitter approach or X approach without having anything against social media. But many times in 150 characters, many, many experts, because everybody becomes an expert in an election, uh, they pretend to give you the problem and the solution in 150 characters, it's not as simple as that. Mm. That's something that we are creating means to listen to all those conversations. We do usually monitoring of social media, etc. But it's not as simple. So when we are told election observation is useless, the Commonwealth should have said that these other fellow won the elections. These elections were manipulated. You say, well, but wait a minute. Are we the Electoral Commission? Did we count the votes? So we can't declare a winner. And the winner has to be declared by the Electoral Commission. If the Electoral Commission doesn't do its job, it's a problem. It is a problem. And then, of course, what can we do? Training, technical assistance, law reform, But again, et this is only if you're requested. Exactly. The point I is mean, if, if you they cannot want to do keep it. You, out, yeah. you cannot. You cannot be there. because okay. there is something called sovereignty that yes. is a barrier, okay. and you cannot go into a country condescending attitude and say, yes. "Let me resolve your problem." Okay. Um, in fact, do you we reach out informally to suggest oh, yes. that you should be able yeah. to assist? Is that an yeah. informal approach that you can do? In all possible ways. You see, the beauty of the Commonwealth is that we are very close to presidents and opposition leaders. I give you another case, which is beautiful. It happened recently, well, May last year in uh, Sierra Leone. Well, Sierra Leone is a country, beautiful country, incredible people, but is deeply, deeply polarized. Yes. And of course, the past, the, 
it's, it's painful because they suffer a war that yes. somehow left, uh, is now in peace, they have had 20 years of democracy, they are very proud of their democracy, but certainly there are challenges which they themselves acknowledge and they tell us. Huge polarization and, and between, between sides, and, and it's almost split in the middle. And is it at all tribal-based, or is it? It's a combination really? of okay. tribal and past, because, right. you know, as you know, Sierra Leone was settled by the free slaves who fought in the site of the British Empire in the independence war with the U.S. So they were sent there, and they settled under, under the, 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 in Sierra Leone under the cotton tree, which is a huge seba, Seiba the, the produces some white flowers, and they call it the cotton tree. It, it was a 300-year-old tree then in 1796. And they settled there, and that's how Freetown was called Freetown, and expanded, etc. The country somehow took shape. But polarization was huge between the president, Madabio, and Kamara, and the PC uh, opposition party. And of course, in situations like this, they need the help, like we do in Africa. If you have a family problem, you yes, cannot resolve you it. You call you the aunties and yes, the uncles, yes. and people come and, and come and mediate here. Yes. So that's what they did. They call us the Commonwealth. Please, people, come. I mean, we trust you. You have helped us in the past. Come and tell us, I mean, how can we resolve this issue? Uh, there I can tell you a little story which is amusing. We put in place a peace or electoral pledge that all the candidates would sign before election, stating that they would respect the results, etc., etc. If there was any problem, they would go to court. Basically, it was a call to peaceful Avoid elections. Avoiding violence, yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Avoiding violence and, and and respect for language the use, the process, mm. the institutions, okay. which are not perfect. And that's why we have to keep on helping the, mm. all of our countries, because the institutions are not perfect. So uh, we went there in May. I think it was the 5th of May last year, 2023. And we were going to have this pledge signed by all the candidates on the following day. That night, a huge storm happened in, in Freetown, like never before. I mean, incredible thunders, lightnings. Well, a lightning fell right on the cotton tree that was now 500 plus years old and split, split it right it. in the middle. Wow. It collapsed. Of course, to understand the implications of this, it's like here in Kenya, in central Very province, nice. if a mugumu tree falls, you start looking for who is going to die <laughs> in this room. Because for sure somebody yes, it's will... A very important it's, symbol. It's, it's a symbol of, yes. of something bad is going to yes. happen. So. That morning, uh, well, partly because we realized, look, we are dealing here with a very delicate situation. We did not know what had happened. I decided to go to church at 6 in the morning. And Abiola Summonu, who is the head of Africa in the Commonwealth, she was praying in the mosque because, you see, we are beautiful people of different faiths, some of none, mm -hmm. but somehow we are all praying. The Secretary General was praying because it, we saw this is impossible, this is not going to happen. The United Nations did not believe this was going to happen because As in the, the leaders, no, oh. the leaders will not Signing. come and sign Signing. this pledge. Okay. This is madness. This mm -hmm. will be an embarrassment. Well, in charge, the priest said, last night a lightning fell on the cotton tree and this and bah, since 1796 that tree was the symbol yes. of something bad is going to happen and I have here a branch of the cotton tree. After that, after mass, I went to the priest and told him, give me the branch. Why? Because the leaders are signing today this peace agreement. They will not sign anything. Well, but just give it to me. And I rushed with the branch to, to the secretary general and to Abiola and said, look, this is what happened last night. 
And this is the and this is the branch. branch. Let's change the speech, and we have to transform the lightning on the cotton tree as a positive sign. This is the new birth. The Secretary General said this is the new birth of 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 Sierra Leone, of the freedom, of democracy, mm -hmm. and new opportunity to build together the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, at nine in the morning we went to the hall. Six hundred people there. The president came, the opposition leader Kamara came, all the candidates, 16 political parties represented, they all signed. And when he gave, she gave her speech, she said, well, uh, last night a it's lightning fell on the tree, it collapsed, and this and that. And she was paraphrasing the national anthem of the country. It was a beautiful speech. And in the end, she transformed what could have been a curse into a blessing. And this is the new birth of the new Sierra Leone. It's your responsibility. You have to pull it together. And here is the branch of the cotton tree. And people were in tears, clapping. And they came somehow. The president came on stage, and the opposition, the opposition. leader came on oh. stage. And she, she joined their them hands. Together. Yeah, brought the them branch. together. And the branch in the middle, photos were taken. And this went immediately into the press. And of course, all that Calm lower the down. tensions, okay. calm the tensions, and the country went through elections quite peacefully. There may have been one or two skirmishes here and there, mm. but by large, very peaceful. Now, of course, what happens is that election is a process. Yes. It's not an event. So after elections, something else continues happening. Mm. And we have had to accompany Sierra Leone with, by the hand because they asked us for help. They asked for expertise, etc., to, to help them reform some institutions, okay. bring together the, the parties, and try to resolve this drama. So this is a beautiful example of how the Commonwealth is helping each and every of these 56 countries to go, to go through their democratic path. We cannot say too much. We never said anything on social media when we were there because you have to keep the trust of all the sides. And anything you say to the press could be misunderstood. So you avoid making statements. People think you are doing nothing. They think the Commonwealth is useless. No. The same we did with Kenya before the election. Rai Laudinga and President Ruto went to to Marlboro House, and we had a Marlboro House dialogue for peace, where both of them committed themselves to respect the results, the results and challenge in court, and go to court if they had a problem, as they did. Yes. And well, you may say I would, I, I don't like losing, but if the court said I lost, well, I lost, and that's yes. it. So it's very important the work that is done quietly behind in the, the scenes and the technical assistance. Okay. Because when the commissions, the courts, the institutions do not do their job, then, well, we offer them technical assistance to prepare them better to change whatever systems have to be changed to do it. So, as you said, it's a process, it's not an event. Mm. One of the key participants of that process is voters. Yeah. I think one of the challenges we're facing um, is we're not seeing a good turnout in some of the elections, a sufficient turnout to reflect, it, you know, because uh, democracy, those elections are supposed to reflect the will of the majority. Mm. But if you have a low turnout, you never mm. have the will of anyone reflected, yeah. really, because it's a minority turnout, and even then it's yeah. divided. So w this issue of voter apathy, what what um, advice or what, what, what does the mm. Commonwealth... Um, support in terms well, of know, increasing numbers. Yeah, voter apathy is, is somehow a, a, a sickness. Um, not only in Africa. I mean, actually, in Africa is less actually, we have of a problem. Actually, higher turnout yeah, than most countries. Than but most still countries. It's, it's, huge, it's a huge problem in Europe, Okay. for example. Uh, and in some countries in the far east. Um, where you have very low kind of voter turnout. And developing countries are suffering from that identity crisis. 
Um, what we do, well, you know, this, the, the solution to this may have been found by a Kenyan young man. Who is he? He is 26, and he has come up with a game uh, that is somehow a, a video model game after. Hmm? Is it a video game? Yeah. What? Okay. Well, uh, uh, an app okay. more than a game. It's yes. an app. An app that also is in embedded in, or a game is embedded into that app. But basically, what he has done is like fantasy poli fa fantasy soccer, okay. but applied to politics. He calls it Badilico. Mm -hmm. He's still in development, but in development. But he recently won an award from the Commonwealth as one of the best innovations in the governance. Uh, arena yeah. to bring young people back to democracy, to participation. Why? Because with this game, you can assemble your own cabinet and depending... Also, you pick people, but yeah, they are real people. Real like, people. Okay. And then you assemble your own cabinet, and depending on the performance of those ministers in the media, there is a sort of rating. Oh. Uh, um, so you, you, you start becoming involved and uh, following... Exactly. Okay. And then you say, well, yeah, I want to pick this. What could have happened if this person was the vice president or this person was the minister How would of they war, perform? et cetera, et cetera. And, and this competition between them. Not only that, but it allows you to co allows politicians to communicate directly with the youth through algorithms. And then you can also follow what are the main issues people are discussing in Mombasa in uh, whatever, uh, Samburu, mm. uh, in Dumberi. I mean, you can map somehow issues being discussed among young people in the country. Okay. It's very interesting. It sounds very interesting. And, yeah. okay, I hope the development continues going ahead. He is called Ngatia, Gatia Mohoya. Mm -hmm. And, well, those are the type of innovations we are seeing coming up. Also, certainly, there is artificial intelligence. That's so, but that's problematic, isn't it? No, I think it's an opportunity. You see, there is no, no painting without dark sights okay. or shadows. Or, I mean, you have light, but then you have parts which are more obscure. The same happens with artificial intelligence. It's a lot of light, certainly like happened with computers, when computer software came up, then viruses also are created. Well, it is true, artificial intelligence will be a challenge, but it's a huge opportunity. And governance can make use of, has to make use of artificial intelligence to run countries better. I mean, sometimes just imagine if ministers or president had in their hands a tool that give you sound advice and proposes sound solutions to problems you are facing. And I think my issue is sound because we exactly. had, we've had problems with the solutions that are being proposed or fake solutions, you know? Yeah, we've had exactly. even fake the, legal cases created. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all solutions, solutions will always appear, but some of them are not solutions. Yes. Some of them create bigger problems. Yes. And I think it's one of the things that is happening to us in the country with these issues of the judiciary. Well, the corruption in the judiciary, I always said, look, independence of the judiciary meant that now the chief justice cannot tell a judge how to decide. But it doesn't mean there is no corruption because you, a, a party could try to corrupt this that or that or that judge. judge. Yes. But what you are sure of is that there cannot be a call from State House to the Chief Justice giving orders on how to decide, and the Chief Justice telling this judge, decide like this, which is a very important issue in the separation of powers. But also that if laws are not properly drafted, well, they can be taken to court and challenged. And this will annoy the government. I mean, it would annoy me yes. if I say, well, I want this law to be functional and I want this levy to be collected but then suddenly a court, a judge who knows nothing about mathematics tells me that this cannot be done because it goes against the constitution. But you say, well, 
but precisely this is the rule of law. Instead of throwing mud at the judge, try to see, well, why did the judge say this? And what should the attorney general do to reverse this? Should you take it back to parliament and then pass a new law? It takes longer, but it's, it's stable. It's I mean, those are checks, yes. exactly, checks and balances. Mm. So sometimes when I see uh, the president's frustration, I understand them, but my idea is, hey, look at the advisors you have and demand more from them. Better advice as exactly. well. Exactly. Better, Better advice, more sound, I mean, foolproof, because the president wants solutions now. Yes. So the advisors should be ready to give the president sound advice that can produce the solutions as fast as possible given the constraints of checks and balances. Otherwise, we become a dictatorship, and the president may, will make terrible mistakes because he will be surrounded by yes men and yes women who have no, no, no filter. And, and that's not what the president wants, I'm sure. No. Um, one of the concerns we have um, in Africa is voter interference through use of AI through use of technology. Mm. Um, I mean, what what can be done from your perspective in the Commonwealth yeah. in relation to these threats? Because they are real. Yeah. We know that Cambridge Very Analytica yeah. have been involved in multiple yeah. elections yeah. to negative effects, actually. Yeah. And they, I, I think that this is maybe one of the reasons voters might not go yeah. and vote, because maybe they feel that even if they exercise their right, it will be interfered with. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Part of the, the new model we are trying to look at when we do election observation is that monitoring of social media and social media manipulation. Um, that's why we tend to invite social media experts to elections. And we do so freely. I mean, government uh, have always been very supportive of this, knowing that sometimes we will invite social media experts who are not government friendly. But they'll also have their own people presumably involved or? Well, I mean, you see, um, the thing that when you invite observers to observe an election, you are inviting them on a personal basis because of their reputation they have, because of their experience or their knowledge not because of their political affiliations. Um, so in Ghana, for example, we did a social media analysis. Do you do, you do it live as, yeah, as live. the results are being transmitted? Live. In exactly. Yeah. It was very interesting because we realized in Ghana that there was social media manipulation. And this manipulation was coming from the US, from Russia, and from China and from Ghana itself. Okay. Plenty of fake news, plenty of BOTs, bots mm. being used, fake accounts, etc. And somebody was paying for this, and it was on both sides, both parties, oh. the government and the opposition. But of course, once we mentioned that in the report, then it became clear to the government and the opposition that they have to be more careful, because now we are being observed and people will know. Well, but the report is after the event? Or the yeah, report after the event. Okay, after so during event. that, you weren't able to stop it by just No, stop. You, you can't. I mean, you the, can't this, do that. Yeah, but so it's more for the, few, what, for the next one. Exactly, and what we are trying also to do is to make sure that the electoral commissions also start monitoring social media. Because and they, parties, they need the technical capacity, exactly. right? Then we have to help them to have that technical know-how. Because parties are in principle accountable to electoral commissions. So if parties engage into fake media and, and manipulation of electors... I mean the, yeah, the fact that the government and the opposition are doing it, in, one, in some ways you feel like maybe it's balancing out, but in others it just means it's that... Obviously, everybody realizes how, how powerful social media is. Yeah. And so actually, everyone wants to, yeah. wants to be involved, yeah. right? Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, social media is very powerful. And it's different from country to country. I, mean, I some think in Kenya, it's quite powerful. <laughs> it's quite powerful. But also, in some other countries, you say, well, 
social media is very powerful, but uh, it's more Facebook or it's more so it Instagram yes. or it's more X yes. or it's more. So you have to also know which social media is the how, one that mm. will be relevant. Um, I, I think one of the questions I have is that in many ways, your perspective in the Commonwealth is to equate democracy with elections. But uh, I think uh, other people have challenged this link. You can have uh, Professor Chidi from Nigeria, he calls this performative democracy. Mm -hmm. You have the illusion of mm. democracy because every four or five years, you go through like, you know, mm. almost a sham where you pretend to vote and yet you are having the same leaders. Yeah. So, so is it not true that we are not they are not the same thing. Yeah. You cannot tell me because we have an election regularly, we then have democracy. Absolutely right. You see, democracy is not equal to elections. Democracy is the rule of the majority with the respect of the rights of the minorities. Um, how do you determine that majority? Usually, it has been through elections. But of course, when elections are manipulated, and are not free and fair. Or maybe you don't have enough people turning up to tell you what the exactly. majority want. Yeah. Of course, I mean, what happens is that in some countries, it, it's compulsory to vote. Which countries uh, are those? Australia, for example. Oh. You don't vote, you don't, I mean, you may not even be allowed to travel or something. Wow. So in most countries, it is not compulsory. So, well, you have to play also with that balance. Some mm. people express their take by not voting. Yes, it's a protest. Exactly, it's or, a protest. Or some people say, no, go and vote, but put a spoiled ballot, yeah. and that's your, that's exactly. your protest. What I th always tell people is, if you don't vote and you don't pay taxes, you have no right to complain because you are not participating in the process that allows you to fix things. Yes. But what if that process is stacked against you, you're a minority community, and you are already disadvantaged, and you don't see the candidates reflecting you? Yeah. Why, why would you feel that you should still go out and vote for these people who have nothing to do with you? Well, you see, the problem is that are you resolving that by not voting? No, you are perpetuating the you elite. You are perpetuating the elite. But I think the issue of taxes is very controversial because if you have an illegitimate government imposing harsh taxation. Yeah. You know, the thing is poor people pay more in taxes than rich people because yes. poor people pay indirect taxes yeah. that you can't avoid. Yeah. And rich people avoid, avoid, they are able to avoid yeah. the direct taxes. Yeah. So I, I think I would well, object to to saying we all have no, to pay taxes. We all pay taxes, in, in but the way, poor exactly. pay more. Yeah. Yeah. The, what I'm saying, when you avoid uh, tax avoidance, is a uh, is like a cycle exactly and then if you avoid taxes on top of that you don't vote well i mean you always have a right to complain but yes it's like come on fulfill your civic because duties because you haven't taken part exactly fulfill your civic duties and then come and tell us how we can improve it yes it's a little bit the the dilemma the the important thing i think there is public participation. You see, when you shy away from participating, you are not helping the situation. So what happens... And that, that vacuum is filled by, is filled obviously, if by other darkness. people, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it does. By obscure, uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, ideals and, and people who don't have the country at heart. Yes. So sometimes when they tell me, no, I'm not in politics because I'm honest, I say, well, don't say that because, fantastic, you're not in politics. Not everyone has to be in politics. Not everyone has a vocation for politics. But it's not because you are honest. Because, I mean, perhaps that's why there is so much corruption in politics. Yes. I, I think, though, this is something I've grappled with personally, that, uh, you know, there are people who go into the political system believing they can change it from mm. the inside. 
And once they join, and then once they join, they, they find become that part it's of a the problem. system. It's yeah. a it's a very difficult system, mm -hmm. and it starts with things like campaign financing, mm -hmm. like at the heart of it. So, I don't know. Um, and then there are those who say, no, you have a violent revolution like the American Revolution. Yeah. You overthrow your oppressors and you start from scratch. Yeah. Well, you see, violence is never the the solution. I always say you cannot do evil hoping that some good will come come, come out of it. Certainly, I mean, the human genius is such that you can always get some good out of a bad situation, but you shouldn't look for the it. The intention should always be. And then also, mm. the other thing is to keep trying, because the great thing of, of human beings is that, yes, we keep trying, even when it makes no sense, apparently. We keep trying and try again to find a solution, to find a way out. I mean, you cannot guarantee success, but you guarantee failure by giving up. Yeah, yeah that's, tr that's true. I think it's just, um, if, you, if you had some advice from, you know, for your fellow Africans um, who are going to be having the opportunity this year to participate in elections, what, what advice? I mean, it's b bearing in mind it's a process, not just the, on the day. What should they be doing now before the election, some of them are many months away. Is there anything they should do now and up until the day of the elections? Well, you see, I would say get out and vote. You have to be registered. There's usually a process exactly. and yeah. some Register, paperwork. But and do whatever you need to do so as to be able to vote and then get out of your bed, of your house on election day and vote. Because and after, when you don't like the result, what should you do? You see, but it's very hard to manipulate an election where the people has really spoken so clearly. And we have seen examples of that in many countries where you thought, well, the election is going to be manipulated and it's going to be stolen, yeah. has already been decided, yeah. and suddenly something else happens. And they shock, even government circles, but it's very hard to manipulate an election where the people have really spoken. I mean, the voice of the people is very hard to, to so share. So that means numbers. You need to be out in numbers. Yeah, exactly. And, and usually many dictatorships survive by... A Suppressing abs votes? No, by abs uh, absenteeism. Yes. People say, well, this guy has won the elections always, he's going to be there forever, why am I going to vote? Yes. Well, that's why he will be there he forever, will be there. not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Thank God we don't have many of those cases, but certainly, I mean, it's something that... And also, the second thing is if you have a vocation for politics, do something about it. And I don't say you have to run for presidency because... Perhaps that's not realistic, but even at the low level Maybe politics, county, at the local level. Local level. Exactly. Mm. Not low because everything is important in politics, but local level, mm. it's, it's very important to get involved and to try to make a little change there. This is something you realize, you see in developed countries, that very highly reputable people, even CEOs of big companies, get involved. In local in their politics. Local, yeah, in their local politics, because they want to, it's, it's part of their civic duty in a way, and that's a true democracy. The participation yeah. at a grassroots, yeah. maybe. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, we would like to invite you back maybe after a number of these elections to hear your thoughts. I think it's an on, ongoing problem mm -hmm. around the world. It's not an Africa problem, it's worldwide. Um, but thank you so much for speaking to us today, and uh, we are ha crossing our fingers and toes that we will have peaceful elections in Africa and around the world. Fantastic. And as I said, you cannot guarantee success, but you guarantee failure by giving up. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you.